Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Alex Edmonds, who is a professor at London Business School in Finance and also the um, author of this book called Grow the Pie, How Great Companies uh, Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. Welcome, Alex. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be on your show. Now, uh, I do a lot of work with pension funds, and um, you know they are always interested in social impact, right? Or you know what they have been calling ESG for, for the last couple of years. And, and of course, the, the big debate that they have is, right, is the pursuit of this goal uh, something that is in conflict with their fiduciary duty to maximize returns for their beneficiaries, right? Or uh, are they sort of, you know? in alignment, like working towards the same goal can, Mm -hmm. you know, looking for these features be um, leading indicators of, of future performance. And, you know, the the folks go back and forth and the the data seems to be ambiguous, but I think what you've highlighted is that there is data that points in both directions, but it kind of depends on how you define the problem. And what what I liked about this, this book is that um, you're spending about half your time kind of, trying to convince the shareholder primacy folks that we need to take into consideration purpose. And you spend about half the time right, trying to convince the the purpose people that, you know, shareholder capitalism is, is actually a, a good thing. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a place where not a lot of people live. And that's what I really uh, appreciated uh, about the book. So, um, so maybe we can, we can jump right in, uh, and say, you know, how did you get interested in this topic? Because no, not a lot of finance professors are, are interested in engaging directly these, these sorts of issues. And I think that's, that's sort of a problem for the, for the field. Well, certainly, I just first certainly want to start by saying you had a really great summary of my position in, in your introductory remarks. So there are some people who say ESG is amazing, it always improves returns. There are others who are completely anti-ESG, in no circumstance can it improve returns, let's ban people from using it. But the reality is, in the middle, some ESG factors do enhance returns, and others might be in conflict. But how did I get into this topic of ESG to begin with? I never considered myself an ESG person. I just wanted to look at what creates long-term value within organizations. And my first job was as an investment banker at Morgan Stanley. And what was interesting to me is that even though that was a company where pure economic incentives should be enough, they weren't. So economic incentives were huge. So you got large bonuses, which are large amounts of money for a 21 year old. And you also got the prospect of promotion to associate and vice president. So it didn't matter how work, how your bosses treated you. You should have just worked hard just for the promotion and for the bonus. But really small things, soft factors, corporate culture, they made a huge difference. And so when I went to MIT to do my PhD, while everybody else, given it was MIT, they were looking at quantitative rational factors, I wanted to look at the human element. Is there a link between employee satisfaction and long-term shareholder value? And if there's a link, is it correlation or is this causation? And this led to uh, one of my first papers on ESG. It published in 2011, finding that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered shareholder returns that beat their peers significantly over a 28-year period. But I never mentioned ESG once in this paper. I wasn't, as I mentioned, an ESG person. I just thought of how can we increase long-term value? And to increase value for shareholders, you not only need something that increases value for the company, but you also need it to be something which is mispriced by the market. The market doesn't get it. And this is why I think these intangible factors are quite good potential because they are things that do matter. But if the market thinks, well, I don't understand it, I don't trust the data, then it may well be mispriced. And so that then led to my more recent book, Grow the Pie. And so you might think, well, why do they call the book uh, Grow the Pie? Is if we think the value that a company creates is a pie, that pie can be given to shareholders in the form of profits or stakeholders in the form of fair taxes, fair wages and fair prices. And exactly as you outlined at the start, Greg, people want to split the pie in their favour. So if you're a shareholder capitalist, you might say, well, treat workers as badly as possible, pay them as little as possible, maximize my profits. And if you're somebody who wants to stand up for society, you might be very skeptical about business. And you say, well, let's straight jacket companies. 
And what I'm saying, and this is why I end up with this um, middle ground, which often people don't occupy, is research suggests the pie can be grown if you are doing things to help society, then in the long term, you become more profitable. And conversely, how do companies become profitable in the long term? It's not that they've extracted from society, it's they've created value for their stakeholders. Well, now I teach a course on strategy and in strategy class, right? We use these terms. We talk about value creation and, and value capture, right? And we say, look, you, you know, you can't capture something that, that you didn't create. And so we, we often encourage people in the world of strategy to think first about the value creation and then think about the value capture. But at the end of the day, right, the, the price of the stock is a function of the, the, the value capture. So um, if value capture ultimately is, is what matters, why is it that if you prioritize value capture, you, you capture less? I mean, this seems kind of counterintuitive, right? You know, because a lot of what you're describing is is a mindset. And you're saying, you know, start with the value creation and then work backwards to value capture. And, you know, the way I tell my students is, you know, th there's probably going to be a way for you to make this Pareto improving. But, but it, you know, not always. So why is mindset, like, how should that, why does that matter? Like you, you said, that profit is a is is a, is a consequence, not a, a goal. Um, but you wind up getting more profitable when you make it not a goal. Like this, this seems really weird. Why would that be true? You're absolutely right, Craig. It, it shouldn't be true if the world was completely rational and we had perfect foresight. So, if I was a company with perfect foresight, I should want to treat my employees well. Why? Not because of any paternalism, not because I'm altruistic, but I should be able to calculate if I treat my employees well, they will work harder. I'm going to capture more value from them because they're going to be more loyal to me and I can exploit that in the future. And that would be the same for many other decisions. You might think, well, if I invest in reducing my carbon footprint, if I invest in customer loyalty, I will be paid that, that back in the future. But as we know, people are not fully rational. They might be myopic. They might not think beyond five or, or, or 10 years, or sometimes even beyond the next quarter. And if we only focus on the things that we can see or that we can predict with some relative degree of certainty, then there might be many investments that we are foregoing just because the fruits are, are too difficult to, to envision. And so this is why I think that companies can do better by having a different approach to business. If you want to be a successful business, you do things that other companies won't do. And in a world in which every other company wants to reduce something to a financial calculation and will only do things if the net present value is clear to see, then if you're a company that tries to do something for the greater good, it may well be that unexpectedly that leads to some value capture, even though value capture was never the original motivation. So that all sounds pretty hypothetical. So let me give a, a concrete example. So in 2007, Vodafone, the UK telecoms company, it chose to launch m -Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. So that allowed people to transfer money from phone to phone just as easily as you could send a text message. Now, they did this genuinely to solve the problem of financial inclusion in Kenya. At the time, 15 million Kenyan adults were unbanked. And so this lifted hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty. And now they are able to capture some of the value from that through charging a small percentage of every transaction as a fee. But back then in 2007, it would be really difficult for them to have forecast that they would be able to, to monetize this and make it profitable. Had they just focused on core strategy, the strategy they had at the time was to expand in the West and to win Spectrum license auctions in the UK because that was where there was money to be made. So one of the messages of the book is actually the best way to pursue a goal, let's say it's profits, is not actually directly. If you go in with the mindset, and you're right to highlight mindset, Greg, with the mindset of, can I make money from this? There are many good things that do make money in the long term, but because that monetization is unexpected and difficult to predict, if you have the mindset of, I'm only going to do something 
if it makes me money, then I might not actually take that action. Just like well, what you might think is, is the meaning of life. So I'm clearly not a philosopher, I'm a finance professor, but if you say the meaning of life is happiness, if I go through every decision asking, will it make me happy? I would probably eat lots of chocolate cake and drink a lot of alcohol. Now, yes, if I was rational, I would calculate the effect on my future happiness. But if I'm not fully rational, maybe a better approach will be my goal is to be a great father, husband, friend, colleague. And if I do those things, trying to create value, not to capture value, in the end, those actions might ultimately bounce back and help me in the long term. So isn't this just sort of mistaking uh, kind of short term metrics for long term metrics? I mean, look, we, ever since the ancient Greeks and particularly right during the Enlightenment, people would make a distinction between sort of, um, you know, narrow self-interest and, and enlightened self-interest. And, and now, you know, we have people like, you know, Michael Porter talking about, right, you know, uh, sort of, you know, your, your, your narrow um, NPV and sort of this, you know, enlightened, right, NPV. And in fact, I think, you know, Milton Friedman, I mean, his, his I think you're, you're trying to rehabilitate his original quote, which I think has been mm -hmm. um, somewhat uh, bowdlerized, right, in, in, in the literature, Right when when he talks about the purpose of of the corporation is 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 to make money, right? I mean, he he did include the possibility that in order to make money, you have to think about your your stakeholders, right? You're absolutely right on, on all counts. So, so you you introduced uh, the podcast, Greg, by talking about the pension funds dilemma: is it that having social impact will be at the expense of financial returns? The answer is it probably will be in the short term, but in the long term, a lot of these trade-offs, not all, but a lot of them are resolved because what you do to help society, it often does bounce back and help you in the long term. And this was key to Milton Friedman's article. So nowadays, if you want to be accepted into polite society, you argue how Milton Friedman was just a charlatan, was really narrow-minded. He argued that companies should only focus on profits. But if you read the article more carefully, he said that you should only focus on profits because as long as you define these profits as long term profits, the only way that a company can make profits in the long term is if it invests in employees, if it makes some products that transform customers' lives for the better, if it invests in customer service. So profit is, is not a bad thing as long as we define profits as long term profits, which is why, as you suggested, Greg, I highlight in the book that shareholder capitalism is actually not a bad thing as long as we correctly recognize that shareholder value is long-term shareholder value. Finance 101 tells you that the value of the company is the present value of all future cash flows until the end of time. Well, now, this suggests that there is an, an arbitrage opportunity, or at least right, some, some mispricing in, in the market. Now, in order to take advantage of that, I mean, is it better to have sort of a, you know, a, a long-term you know, fund, or can you, can you make money through short-term activist in, in investing? Um, I mean, can you do it passively? I mean, th there are these funds, right? These these SRI yeah. funds that that use kind of screening and, and so forth, but they, they don't seem to perform very well, right? I mean, there's I mean, mm -hmm. part of it's because of the higher fees, right? And I think uh, BlackRock figured that out. But but um, but but part of it is because they, you know, they exclude like you know sin industries and stuff. So I mean, when when mm -hmm. we have sort of a, a passive screening fund. Is is that going to be able to capture this, you know, long term drift towards correct pricing or, or do we need to have sort of activist funds that kind of jumpstart this this process of corporate change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting points in, in the question that you just, just posed, Ray. So first, let me focus on, on, on passive funds, which just um, will tend to exclude. And so I don't think that is something which leads to long-term outperformance. I don't think the data has suggested that. And so why? What I highlighted earlier when I talked about my employee satisfaction study is if you want to outperform in the long term, you have to base your trading strategy on something which is likely to be ignored by the market. So the idea of let's exclude oil and gas because we recognize that these might be stranded assets. Well, many people recognize this now. So people recognize the importance, the urgency of climate change. And so those companies might be underpriced. So from a purely financial perspective, I'm ignoring for now the social aspect. From a purely financial perspective, it is not clear that you maximize your returns by excluding those companies. Instead, 
the best things to do is perhaps to exclude some companies which might be seen as positive ESG companies that were massively overhyped. So if you didn't invest in electric vehicles in the early 2020s, you probably would have done really well because those companies, even though we recognize that they are the future, they didn't justify the really lofty valuations that they had back then. And on the flip side, it may be that um, there's real value in finding some companies which might not pass certain ESG screens, but do create a lot of value. So one example might be a, a semiconductor company. Why? Because when you manufacture semiconductors, this releases a lot of perfluorocarbons to the atmosphere, and that's really bad for trapping and heat. Yet yeah, semiconductors could be the solution to global warming. They could be used in solar panels. So often these rather blunt ESG screens, they only look at the harm that you create, not a lot of the positives that you can create as well. So I think this is something which it's difficult to do with a purely passive strategy. And this is why, can to your other question, the flip side of your question, Greg, can this really be something that leads to alpha in the long term? I truly believe it can be if you have a deep, fundamentals-based approach. And so indeed, a lot of the um, really true responsible investors that I interact with, they try to do grassroots analysis to, let's say, to understand the corp company's corporate culture beyond just diversity statistics. Let's try to understand its culture for diversity, equity, inclusion, for tolerating and encouraging different viewpoints, and also other cultural elements beyond the EI, for example. And so with that, they know that it might not immediately pay off, but it might be something which pays off in the long term. And so investors who are willing to take these deep fundamentals approaches, but also have the patience to ride out short term turbulence, they could indeed outperform. One final thing that you mentioned in the question, which is also interesting, was this idea of short term activists. And this is indeed what um, the common portrayal is is of activists who come in and strip out a lot of assets in the company and just basically pillage it for the short term. That makes great headlines for a newspaper, could even make some great books, but it just isn't supported by the evidence. And indeed, in chapter six of the book, I look at the more sober, large-scale evidence on shareholder activism. And indeed, this suggests that it creates long-term value. So how do you try to reform a company? you try to improve it for the long term. The idea that I can asset strip it and then it's sell it to some greater fool who doesn't realize that I've asset stripped. Maybe I could have done that a couple of decades ago when the market was less sophisticated. But nowadays, if you look at a lot of these mainstream investors, they are looking at long-term factors. Some of the most valuable companies today, such as the tech companies in the US, they are worth far more than their quarterly earnings because investors are valuing the future. So indeed, the most successful activist investors are the ones that will try to improve a company's productivity and innovation. And indeed, there was some nice academic research which looks at the source of the value creation from activist shareholders. And it's not value extraction, value capture. It is indeed things such as improving productivity and improving innovation. Well, if you're trying to design an investment strategy to try to capture this, this alpha, I mean, it's hard to do in a in a passive way, right? Or in a in a you know smart mm -hmm. passive way because the the, the data is not there, right? I mean, we, we can we can look at earnings and earnings volatility. We can we can look at you know various accounting ratios, but but there isn't. I mean, I know company there are entities like SASB that are trying to standardize reporting in this area, but but this would require a, a, either a lot of you know in depth research or the reliance mm. on sort of external metrics. So, you know, you mentioned the, the yeah. Parnassus Fund, right? Which which looks mm. at the, you know, great place to work stats or, or you know, glass door uh, information. I mean, are, are, how do we get the data that we would need to, you know, mm. evaluate these these companies in terms of their, um, their pie growing mentality? Yes, so my views on this might be somewhat contrarian for somebody who supports the idea of responsibility and purposes. I'm not really sure that data is the solution. Information is the solution, but information is more than just data. So what do I mean by this? So there are indeed frameworks like SASB, which are asking companies to report their statistics. So they might be things like carbon emissions and water usage and diversity in the boardroom and the wider workforce. And I'm not saying that those things are useless. Those things could have value. But number one, 
If they are quantitative, then most likely the market has priced them in. You can get any algorithm to just search companies for the statistics and to form trading strategies based on that. So I don't think it's something that gives you the competitive edge. But also, number two, to assess a lot of these deep fundamental issues which lead to the long-term outperformance of a company that goes beyond just data. So again, let me just take diversity as a goal because it's a really hot potato issue right now. And I think the reason why it's become so controversial is that people have reduced this complex topic of DEI to one very simple characteristic, which is demographic diversity. If somebody's admitted to university or made president of the university or put on the board, the only thing people seem to care about is his or her gender or race when they've got many other things that they could bring. It could be their cognitive diversity, their socioeconomic diversity, and for a company, you don't want to just recruit a mix of people. You want to make sure that the corporate culture is one that embraces and encourages challenge. And so if you're just trying to look at those metrics, you're going to miss so many other deeper things which matter more for companies' long-term potential. So one analogy is uh, no child left behind. So around 20 years ago, um, there were education departments which said, let's bring metrics to education. And the language they were using is pretty similar to the language that investors use now with ESG. They say, if we get data, we can allocate capital to the best performing companies. Back then, departments of education said we could allocate resources to the best performing schools and shut down others. But then what happened was people just talked to the test. They just focused on the data which was being reported. Just like now, it might be companies make their hiring decisions based on only demographic diversity statistics, and they will underweight the more important other dimensions of, of a person's human capital and ability to contribute. So I think sort of data still should be useful, but data is only a starting point which will then lead to a conversation. So it might be that as a deep fundamentals investor, you look at certain data points such as its carbon footprint, such as its water usage, but you don't then just, just sit there in front of your Excel spreadsheet and say, I'm going to dump this company because it's got a low carbon footprint. It's not because it's a high carbon footprint. You might then want to ask the company, well, why is it that its carbon footprint is lagging behind its peers? And they might say, well, our peers have sold their most polluting plants, but we don't think that is actually good for society because when they sold them, they sold them to other buyers and those buyers just operate these plants as before and don't care about pollution. We actually try to hold on to our most problematic plants and manage down their carbon emissions and that would lead to a much more nuanced story than you get by just looking at the numbers, similar to just looking at a test score to, to, to um, evaluate a school is certainly going to be insufficient and too narrow. Yeah, so, the, you know, I think you mentioned how oil companies will sell off their polluting oil things, but you know, also there's the example of, you know, the pharma bro who bought the drug and mm. jacked up the price, but there was a company yes. that sold him the, the drug and presumably, you know, profited from the, the sale because they received, you know, the present value of whatever the pharma bro was going to do, right? Yes, that's absolutely right. And so if you just want to improve your statistics, you can do this by selling your most problematic plants. And indeed, there was a nice a systematic academic research study on this, which looks at what happens when a company has some environmental scandal or negative news event. How do they respond to this? They respond to it by reducing their carbon footprint, which might sound great, right? We respond to a bad event by, um, by addressing the problem. But how do they reduce their footprint? They sell the plants to other buyers and those plants actually become more polluting under those other buyers. So again, with these metrics, this could just lead to people just managing to the metric. You can hit the target, but miss the point. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned uh, one fund, the, the Parnassus Fund, which is built on, right, looking at employee satisfaction. Um, and, um, you know, this, this fund has uh, outperformed, right, the S&P. But, um, you know, how do we know that that is a causation and not uh, just correlation, right? Because I mean, look, people mm -hmm. are going to be happy when they're at a company that's doing well, right? Where the stock price is mm -hmm. going up, they're, they're probably they're probably get some options, right? I mean, how, isn't this sort of could this potentially be reverse causation? 
Absolutely. So th- these are very fair challenges. And I think it's really good to, to be challenging as, as you have been, because there is confirmation bias. We often want to latch on to a conclusion that we would like to be true. And we'd love to believe that if you treat workers better, the company does better. So how do I address this issue? So with reverse causality, you might think, well, the company's already doing well. And that's why employees are happy. So this is why I look at stock return. So the stock return is the change in the stock price between this year and the future. So we could take stocks, let's say right now in January 2024, and let's say if employees are happy because the company is already doing well and able to pay for free gyms and free massages and all of those things, then that company's stock price will already be high today. Now, if the stock price is already high today, then it's unlikely to outperform going forwards. Why? Because the stock price is already high, the starting point is high. So by looking at the future stock return, so that's the change in the stock price between now and the future, that is something where it's going to be less likely that it is that um, good performance causes employee satisfaction rather than reverse. Now, you still might not be fully convinced by this, because you might say, what happens if the market was slow to respond? Maybe the company is already performing well, but for some reason, the stock price is not capturing that today. Well, so what I have to do is control for other things like momentum, which is the the market being slow to react. I also look at analyst earnings forecasts. So what do I mean by analyst earnings forecasts? So every three months in the US, companies announce their earnings. And before they do so, the likes of Goldman Sachs and my former employer, Morgan Stanley, they predict what the earnings will be. And when they do so, they look at things in the future. They are trying to be forward working. They take into account the company's current and future prospects. And what I found was that these companies delivered higher earnings releases than these analysts were predicting. Why that suggests that they were doing something which was unexpected, that even professional analysts were not actually being able to capture. So professional analysts look at current performance, they look at other good things about a company like management performance, but given that these companies did even better than what analysts thought, it was likely due to this employee satisfaction factor, which they were not taking into account. Well, don't you also have to control for other factors? I mean, I remember when I had Jerome Dotson, who's the founder of that fund, come and speak in my class. I said, well, you know, did you control for beta? Because, I mean, it seems like most of these companies were, were, were tech stocks. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. I, I, so you have to control for lots of other things. So you have to control. So yeah. this is the importance of looking at studies published in the top academic journals. So nowadays you have the likes of McKinsey and BlackRock trying to churn out reports showing that out certain things generate high returns. And they do this for good marketing purposes, because if they do release a study saying that ethical companies perform better, they're seen as the bastion of ethical capitalism. But they often don't control for things such as industry effects or risk or beta and things like that. So what I had to do was control for beta, but not only control for beta, I also had to control for industry performance. So if indeed the best companies to work for are the likes of Google, and Google has done well because it's a tech company, then that's nothing to do with employee satisfaction. That's just due to it being a tech stock. So I have to control for what industry you're in, recent performance I mentioned, I control for valuation ratio, size, dividend yields, trading volume, a whole host of other characteristics. And then you might think, well, I can only control for what I observe. What about things that are unobservable, like great management quality? And so that's why I look at things like the earning surprises, why? Because equity analysts, they claim to also take into account management quality. But given that I found that these companies were doing even better than what equity analysts predicted, that suggests it wasn't something else like management quality, which was leading to the outperformance. Now, one of the most interesting parts of the book, which I really liked, was how you distinguished between what you're advocating and uh, just generic uh, CSR, right? And so, you know, a lot of companies will say, oh, look, we care about the world. And so we're going to, you know, donate a bunch of money to, to, to charity. And, and, you know, of course, this is the thing I think that, you know, Milton Friedman was particularly disturbed by these sort of just grants to, to charitable organizations and, and so forth. Um, and you highlight the importance of comparative advantage and, and also materiality. And the, the reason why, I mean, I, I, at my business school, you know, we have a bunch of initiatives. And so a lot of students will set aside their Saturdays to, you know, sort through the garbage because they want to be, you know, a zero waste building. And I'm like, you know, maybe we should be spending that time kind of 
training small business people or, you know, educating prisoners about business decisions. And, and you know, you were at Wharton and I Wharton had a sort of small business advisory entity where, you know, MBA students could spend their free time, you know, advising um, kind of under-resourced, un underprivileged businesses. And that seemed like a better use of, of the time. So how do we, how do we evaluate the kind of social impact um, with respect to comparative advantage and, and materiality? Yeah, so this is a really important question. So, so first, it's to so recognize that there are trade-offs to begin with. So, so even though I'm somebody who believes that in the long term, many financial factors and social values are aligned, this is not always true. And so the idea that some people claim is that doing good for society always does well for shareholders. That's a great soundbite, but that isn't true in reality. There are certain things where there are trade-offs. So we can't just blindly do every single bit of social good and expect it to magically lead to higher profits in the long term. And so what are the activities that are most likely to lead to financial outperformance in the long term? They are the ones which follow the two principles that you mentioned, Greg, comparative advantage and materiality. So what are those two? So comparative advantage is doing things that you are good at using your expertise. Yeah, my, For my example, example is Coke. My favorite example is with Coke and, and, the, and the vaccines, right? So, I mean, they have a refrigerated supply chain and refrigerated distribution. And so they're in a great position to distribute vaccines to the remote parts of India and Africa, right? That's, that's exactly right. So I cover in the book Project Last Mile, where, where the Coca-Cola company, they have great expertise in logistics and distribution because they need to make their products available everywhere in Africa. And so this allows them to distribute vaccines. Why is that important? Well, you have great charities like Doctors Without Borders, which get the medicines into a developing country, but that takes it to the local airport, but they might not be able to get it into the rural village. So that's something where the Coca-Cola company uses its expertise in logistics. And notice that this is quite different to the approach that many companies take on what is called CSR, which is to do things not because they're good at it, not because they have comparative advantage in it, but because it's hot, it's in the media. For example, it could be that when George Floyd was murdered, you give lots of money to Black Lives Matter. So clearly as an ethnic minority, I believe in the importance of racial equality, but if you are a, let's say, pharmaceuticals company, is your expertise knowing that Black Lives Matter is a better charity than, say, Doctors Without Borders or the American Cancer Society. No, that is not your expertise. It might be better for you to invest that money in drug development or maybe to invest some employees' time going into local schools and teaching about the importance of science and getting people to be inspired to become scientists in the future. That is using your expertise. So that was one principle, comparative advantage, which is using your expertise. The second is materiality. So that's sort of the opposite direction. Comparative advantage is how can I have a big impact on wider society? Materiality is are the people that we're affecting in society, do they matter for my long-term business success? And so one example might be suppliers. So if you're in a generic industry, let's say um, paints or, or chemicals, maybe your suppliers are relatively generic. You might be using um, uh, oil and gas or other petrochemical sources. Whereas if you're Apple, then your suppliers are really important because your touchscreen glass is something which gives you a huge comparative advantage and so this is why they invest a lot in Corning, their glass manufacturer. They put a lot of financial investment and also a lot of, um, of, of, of intangible investment into them. And so you will invest in the stakeholders that matter most to you. And again, this is something which is uncomfortable because some companies like to claim we care about everybody. That sounds great, but it's unrealistic because you can't care about everybody. There are trade-offs, you've got limited time, and there can also be direct trade-offs between different stakeholders. If I'm an energy company and I close down a polluting plant, that's good for the environment, but it's bad for workers. So I can't be helping everybody. What we need to do is to prioritize. And so this is why the book has the double-edged sword, as you correctly highlighted at the start, Greg. On the one hand, I do highlight that it is rational, it is sensible, it is good business, it is not just woke to care about society. But we can't go to the other extreme and just indiscriminately invest in everything and try to do as much good as possible. We need some framework, we need some principles to know what things to do and what to turn down. Right, and so a lot of the folks who are 
on the kind of social responsibility side, right? They will bemoan high salaries, they'll bemoan share buybacks and so forth. And, and I think you offer vigorous defenses of, of both of those, those practices because mm -hmm. while they might seem disturbing in some way, they, they clearly do in, enhance both shareholder and, and stakeholder value or potentially can if, if done in alignment with these, these principles. Thanks, Ray, for bringing this up. And I think this is why it's important, again, to, to highlight the difference between value creation and, and value capture, or as I use in the book, growing the pie and splitting the pie. So why do people get so upset with high CEO pay? They believe that pay has to have come at the expense of wider society. So the greedy CEO took some money, which otherwise would have gone to other people. Indeed, Abigail Disney was really upset with Bob Iger's salary the first time he was CEO because he got paid, I think it was um, a three-digit uh, amount of money. But why was Iger paid so much? because he created huge amounts of value over a very long time period. And this was not only shareholder value, but it was also stakeholder value. They created a lot of jobs, and a lot of great customer products. And notice his three digit payout, that was not just for one year's work, it was some shares that he had been given, which grew in value over many, many years. So to recognize that actually, how can a CEO have been done well? It's not because he or she has stolen money, but it's as a consequence of creating value for the company. And if your pay is aligned to performance, if the company does well, then the CEO should be well paid as a result. And so this is the same with, with share buybacks or more generally any form of shareholder payout such as dividends. So it is indeed conceptually the case that perhaps companies could pay out huge amounts of money to their shareholders instead of investing in workers or investing in their customers. But again, if you take a sober, hard-headed look at the evidence, what it suggests is that the companies that are paying out to shareholders, how can they do that? Because they've created long-term value. Why can a company pay a dividend? It's because it has created value over a long period of time. And for something like a dividend, it's really difficult to raise the dividend and cut it afterwards because if you cut it in the future, your stock price is going to go through the floor. So typically companies will only raise dividends if they're confident that they can sustain it in the future for many, many years to come. Why? Because they have a sustainable business model. So again, rather than looking at the amount that a CEO has paid or the amount that shareholders were receiving, look at the source. Yes, it could be the case that sometimes CEOs get paid a lot for destroying value, but then the main thing you should focus on is did they destroy value or not, not how much they're paid. Because on the consequence, you are, because on the flip side, you can get CEOs who are paid a lot because they've created a lot of value to look at the value you've created or not created rather than how much you have, have got yourself. Well, last question. You know, you talk about the importance of a well-crafted um, statement of purpose for, for companies. Um, and you also kind of say that Individuals need to also kind of think <laughs> along similar lines, right, in terms of, you know, value creation, value capture. Do, do, and individuals perhaps presumably also have to come up with a statement of purpose, right? You know, why, why is it so difficult to come up with a, a statement of purpose that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some, some of them seem so, so watered down and kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, vague that, that they don't really provide any guidance. Thanks for mentioning this, Greg, because even though um, 10 of the 11 chapters of the book are all about companies, the final chapter just applies the principles of the book to individual personal decisions. Um, and so this is something that I, I'm quite passionate about and try to apply to my own life myself. So I have defined my personal mission statement as to use rigorous research to influence the practice of business. So why is it difficult to come up with a mission statement either for a company or for a person is to mean anything. It has to be selective. You can't be all things to all people. And that's why it's difficult to come up with such a statement because there are certain things that you miss out. So when I say to use rigorous research to influence the practice of business, that rules out just doing research for purely intellectual purposes only to be published in top academic journals and be applauded by fellow academics. Instead, it's something where I'm doing this because I want to influence the way people think and act, which is why it's a huge pleasure for me to be on this podcast. I'm not being paid to do it. It's not for any monetizable reason, but it's consistent with my purpose. And this is why I'm actually currently on academic sabbatical. So I'm not giving sort of certain academic talks, but I still choose to do this because it's consistent with my purpose. If I didn't have such a focused purpose statement, 
it wouldn't give me guidance on how to allocate my time because then I might accept every single invitation because um, that would still be using research. For me, I want to use research if it's something which is practitioner oriented. Well, Alex, thanks so much for joining me. The book is called uh, Grow the Pie, and I, and I recommend it for folks who are in the investment community, but also for folks who are in the social impact world. Um, and hopefully uh, maybe individuals who are interested in just pursuing a life of purpose. Thanks so much. Talk again soon. Thanks so much for inviting me, Greg. Unsiloed Podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 